So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight, which is our eighth Zoom panel discussion since March. Um, our gallery's goal is to produce one such event every month and um, they're getting easier, I think. We're on track for doing just that for 2020. Uh, tonight, it is with tremendous gratitude and joy that our gallery has been able to unite these two distinguished families and these two generations of masters of the medium of clay. The Suzuki and the Wakal studios and homes are separated by a mere five minutes drive in the hills of Tajimi Gifu. As I mentioned last month's Zoom, my first encounter with the, book, with the work of both men, our fathers, was the seminal Japan Ceramics Today exhibition at the Smithsonian in 1983, uh, and was organized by one of our speakers tonight, Louise Court. Um, inspired to pursue this marvelous family, uh, this, uh, this marvelous field for sure, uh, not long thereafter, I managed to have an introduction to the grand patroness of this community of artists, Kikuchi Tomo. Marvelous works by Wakao Toshi Sada, starting with similar ones to the ones I had coveted in the Washington show, were presented to me by Madame Kikuchi through the years and by her staff. However, it took almost 30 years after countless trips to Mino, the Mecca for Ceramics in Gifu Prefecture, to 2016 when I traveled to Chajimi to lay the groundwork for bringing a few avid collectors to Japan to meet these senior artists face to face, most especially Wakao Toshisada. And if you know anything about how things work in Japan, I needed a plethora of introductions to make these uh, auspicious visits a reality. Of course, I was also interested at that time in the work of his upcoming artist son, Kay, whose work I had first seen in 2010 at the Paramita competition, and then was shown several pieces by our dear friend Kuroda Toji of Kuroda Toen in Shibuya. So it was during our tour visit in 2017 when I and our beloved band of avid collectors were seeing these artists interact with their talented sons that I had the idea of combining the work of both families to produce this fathers and sons collaborative exhibition. My goal was to call attention to the challenge of achieving artistic independence within the constraints of centuries old tradition and the bonds of family in a society as highly structured as what uh, exists in Japan. And um, for those who have not seen the show, which is almost everyone in the audience, um, but if you do look at it online, you will see the works blend seamlessly one to the next. Uh, tonight, I believe we have uh, 13 curators uh, registered from coast to coast and uh, academics from seven universities, docents, some members of the press, and uh, quite a number of dealers in the world of Asian art. And as I've said before, this is the silver lining to this COVID nightmare that we're able to get 200 people together and no one has to leave their own homes and they can sleep in their own beds and they don't have to fly anywhere. Uh, I also must thank my uh, Joan B. Mervis limited gallery team who have put this wonderful event together, Bonnie, Yukiko and Chelsea. They've been working for months to get these events uh, organized and to go as seamlessly as humanly possible. And before I introduce our speakers tonight, I must say, I want to give you one lasting quote by Jeffrey Handover, who has an article coming out this month in Ceramics, Art and Perception on this particular show. And Jeffrey wrote, under one roof, father and son, masters of their own unique glazed wares follow their separate artistic paths. The son honors the father by his exemplary artistry both father and son honor tradition while embracing the present, and both arrive at a common destination of distinct, unique beauty. So for a panel, we have uh, three panelists and two artists and one interpreter to introduce. 
Uh, first is someone known to, I think, almost everyone in the audience as uh, Louise Court, who during her tenure as a Asian ceramic specialist at the Freer Sackler Galleries at the Smithsonian, authored a number of books on Japanese ceramics on all of our bookshelves. Together with Andy Watsky, Louise prepared the book and exhibition on Chigusa and the art of tea. She has written countless articles. Um, one very impactful to me was the insightful essay in Soaring Voices, Contemporary Japanese Women's Ceramic Artists. In 2012, Louise was awarded the Koyama Fujio Memorial Prize for her research on historical and contemporary Japanese ceramics and the Smithsonian Distinguished Scholar Award. We are delighted to have her with us tonight. <laughs> and perhaps someone not known to many of you, but well known to me, is Kitman Phillips, or Jean as he is nearly universally call called. And he is the Joan B. Mervis Professor of Japanese Art History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he has taught since completing his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley in 1992. His first love in Japanese art is Nezumi Shino, but his research has focused on the Kano School of Painting and medieval Japanese art and religious practice, on which topic he has published extensively. Together with Louise Court, he is one of the founders of the Japanese Art History Forum. Our third panelist is Catherine White, who has lived and worked since 1988 in the rolling hills of Warrington, Virginia one hour west of Washington, DC. Her clay work is intertwined with a daily practice of drawing and painting. She has had commissions from state gifts from President and Mrs. Obama, and hers is, her work is in the collections of both the Renwick and Sackler galleries at the Smithsonian. Catherine has taught at Washington, DC's Corcoran College of Art and Design for many years. Now for our honored guest from Japan, both Wakao father and son embrace and are inspired by the beauty of the natural world. Toshi Sada in his painterly declaration and Kei in his sculptural forms. Wakao Toshi Sada, who began working in his father's workshop after high school, has wedded two quintessential Japanese aesthetic tra traditions, Grey Shino, Nezumi Ware, and the lyrical Rinpa school of painting. He is now considered the preeminent master of Nezumi Shino ware and is the bearer of the title Intangible Cultural Heritage of Gifu Prefecture. His work may be found in museums around the world, uh, but closer to home at the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the National Museum of Modern Art Tokyo, and the Victoria and Albert in London. Wakao Ke while not choosing to walk in the visible footsteps of his father, embraces the spirit that impels these footsteps. Kei came to his ceramic education in his late 20s after studying photography at university. Instead of the, more, the four main types of Mino ceramics, Kei sought inspiration in the study of Chinese Song, White Ding, and Celadon glazes. He is best known for his ivory crackled and crystallized Celadon glazes. In 2010, he won the prestigious prize at the Padamita Museum in Mie. And our last participant is Yoshizawa Tomo, who is a cultural translator born into a family of craftsmen. Her mother is a weaver. Her father is a Koto musical instrument maker. She now writes and translates mainly in the field of Japanese crafts and culture, bridging cultures of different countries, generations, and societies. She has been an invaluable resource for our gallery as we work across two continents and 13 time zones to bring the event like tonight to you live. Uh, so now um, in this format, I'm going to present some questions to our panelists and then our panelists will also have questions for the artists directly. So my first question goes to Louise. And uh, Louise, can you tell us about the development of Shino ware in the Mino region at the end of the 16th century? And perhaps something about the materials and the aspects of Shino ware that made it so appealing at the time. Oh, with pleasure, Joan, I will try. Um, the secret of the invention of Shino ware and its success is the uh, trove of splendid raw materials. 
in the Mino region where uh, Shino was made and is now made by the Wako Toshisada family. Um, the raw materials include the clay, which you see on the bases of these two Shino glazed pieces, this lovely soft velvety uh, pale gray white clay, uh, the feldspathic rock, which goes into the a translucent white chino glaze that you see again on the edges of these two pieces. And next, please. Um, the third ingredient that is key to the success of chino ware, uh, beginning in the late 16th century, is the pigment look called locally oniita, an iron pigment. And on the base of this tea bowl, again on the left now, you see that where the pigment is not covered by the chino glaze, it shows up brown. But under the chino glaze, a miraculous transformation takes place. And the pigment appears in shades, depending on its thickness, from a rusty red to a deep blue gray. And it's that quality, um, when veiled by the glaze, that enables these materials to be combined and Next, please. Uh, used for ceramics with painted decoration, the distinguished and distinctive mode of Shino ware. Uh, you see in this plate from the Freer Gallery, uh, the combination of pictorial decoration applied with a floppy brush and geometric decoration around the rim. And uh, where the iron is thick underneath the chino glaze and bleeds through, you see dark flecks um, that fortuitously accentuate the grains of millet in this particular painting. Next, please. So 400 years later, Wakao Toshisada Sensei's beautiful work draws on the chino repertory without duplicating any of the historical precedents. Uh, his freshness in his shapes and his drawing and his glazing are all distinctive to his work while evoking to anyone who knows the historical Shino um, those precedents. I wanted to share with you a bowl, tea bowl on the left, which is in the Sackler uh, collection, which show Sackler Gallery collection shows a slightly different approach that Wakao Sensei took um, back in the 1980s, I believe, when this bowl was made. Rather than the careful painting, which we're familiar with on his work, in the tea bowl, he simply poured the brown slip over the glaze, uh, over the bowl, and let it take shape as it would. But what I especially love is the outline of his fingerprints, where he gripped the bowl to glaze it allowing the dark brown of the iron pigment to show through. Next, please. But uh, when I was a graduate student studying, learning about Japanese ceramics, Shino ware and other wares of the late 16th century were described as the most distinctly Japanese ceramics. But what I want to share with you tonight is that we now know that the initial inspiration for Shino ware came from international contacts that resulted from the booming international trade in the 16th century. It's rather strange to realize that for many centuries, Mino potters had been hiding their beautiful pale clay under Song Dynasty style uh, glazes, either celadon glaze as you see on the left or iron glaze as you see on the right. And in the table on the right, you even see that the potter carefully covered up the beautiful pale clay with a coating of iron to make it look even more Chinese. But uh, next, please. The Chinese trade in the 16th century brought a new source of inspiration. And this is the a um, recent realization of archaeologists and scholars in Japan. Uh, the new source of inspiration for the 
Mino area, and in particular, the inspiration that led to the invention of Shino ware was porcelain, Chinese porcelain from the Zhangzhou kilns in Fujian province, decorated with cobalt. So this is a rather surprising uh, inversion of our former sense of where Shino came from. Next, please. But the um, popularity of Chinese porcelain tableware led the Mino potters to think again and reconsider the raw materials that were at hand and to invent the white uh, feldspar-based Shino glaze in combination with the iron pigment over the beautiful pale gray clay. You can see the relation uh, you can see the relationships between these two pieces in the combination of a pictorial center and a geometric boundary. But at the same time, you can see how the, Shino, the Mino potters uh, added their own touch in especially gracefully and gently distorting the shape of the piece so that it's no longer a perfectly wheel thrown circle, but this softly articulated form that um, echoes in uh, Wakao Toshisada Sensei's work as well. Next, please. And another uh, invention of the Mino potters working with Shino ware was this format, the so-called Nezumi Shino or mouse gray Shino, where the entire vessel was covered with iron slip and then a drawing was, or a design, a pattern, was incised through the slip to the white clay. Covered with the white glaze, the Shino glaze, then the white shows up very freshly and crisply as the main motif. Next, please. Uh, I wanted to point out, though, um, the contrast between two phases of production of Shino, which uh, shows up the um, sad reason for its rather quick demise as a popular style in the late 16th, early 17th century. The piece on the left was fired in a single chambered uh, kiln with um, a sort of dampness built into it that led to an under firing of the glaze. Andy Maskey described this very clearly in his presentation on the last Zoom meeting. But the result of this was that the Shino glaze is soft, um, muted, and the design underneath it is veiled in a kind of mist. But in the, uh, but in the year 1607, uh, a new kind of multi-chambered higher firing kiln was introduced to the Mino area, and Shino wears continued to be made in that kiln. But as you can see in the piece on the right, uh, the glaze melted much more completely. It became shiny. And the design underneath the glaze was no longer showed up very sharply and clearly. And this somehow was less appealing to the Japanese audience for such wares. Next, please. And in particular, um, Shino lost out to its rival to the south in the Arita region of southern Japan, where potters there discovered true porcelain clay, truly white clay, and a source of cobalt, and began to make much more um, uh, closely approximating wares uh, following the model of the Chinese porcelain. And so by the 1620s, when these wares uh, began to be made in Arita, the uh, popularity of Shino waned. And it was only in the mid 20th century that this beautiful combination of clay and pigment and glaze was rediscovered and reactivated by artists such as Wakao Toshisada Sensei. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Louise. Um, that was a whole semester of education codified into 10 minutes. Brilliant. 
Um, I think now it would be a great time for you to ask a question directly to Akato Shisada Sensei. Do you have uh, one from him for him? I do. Uh, first of all, can I just say hello to Wakao Sensei after some 40 years? I had the pleasure, Sensei, of visiting you in your workshop in 1973 and again in 1977. So I'm very glad to see you again tonight. But I'd like to ask you um, about your particular fondness for Nizumishino. Uh, what was it that drew you to that format of all of the possible Shino decorative formats? Why, how did you begin, or when did you begin experimenting with it? And why have you found it so fruitful as an approach? Hi. Hey, hey. もう色合いと Mm. Thank you. That's good. That's, um, I, I couldn't agree more. Look mm. at the depth of glaze on this gorgeous Mizuzashi and the big surprise to see this pink interior. Just beautiful. Uh, my next question goes to Jean Phillips. And um, Jean, can you talk about the revival of the tradition of Nezumi Shino in the mid 20th century? and how the work of Wakao Toshisada Sensei fits into that historical lineage. Yes, I can. Thank you. And uh, I'm really happy to have a chance to talk about Nezumishino since it, as you said, is my first love in Japanese uh, ceramics and indeed in Japanese art history, even though I switched over to painting for my scholarship. So well before I decided to pursue a career in art history, um, I was living in Japan and falling in love with Japanese ceramics, traveling about to various kiln sites, and it was the Mino wares uh, that most attracted me uh, in my visits to kilns and my reading. Um, and so what I was particularly attracted to, just visually, uh, was this negative positive reversal that I saw as a wonderful challenge to the usual aesthetics of painted pottery. And I also, of course, admired the rusticity that it shared with other varieties of Shino, as well as other Mino ceramics. One element of that rusticity that particularly attracted me in Nezumi Shino is the frequent play in a single object of oxidation and reduction, the transitions from rusty reds to shades of gray produced by irregular applications of the white chino glaze over iron rich slip. It spoke to me of the alchemy of the kiln. In this most famous Nezumi Shino bowl, Mine no Momiji, the motifs are fewer and more abstract when compared to those of the dish we just looked at. This adaptation suited the tastes of the day for tea wares and left the main burden of aesthetic richness to be carried out by other qualities, 
drama of shape, irregularity of surface, and variation in color. In the 1930s, two men pioneered the revival of Mino ceramics, Kato Tokoro and Arakawa Toyozo. Neither specialized in Nezumishino, but they both produced spectacular examples. Here we see Kato's Tibo Araiso, wave beaten shore. Belying the type name, there is no mouse gray to be seen without careful inspection. It is either buried under thick glaze or oxidized to a warm russet red. Nor is there a pattern of motifs, only the irregular areas of white that can be read as the sea foam suggested by the name of the pot. More compelling is an unstudied quality about it that only comes from Kato's long experience and consummate skill. The bowl speaks to his independent, even brash spirit, and perhaps to his devotion to Zen as well. This bowl by Arakawa could hardly be more different. The cranes stand out boldly in reserve white against dark gray. The decoration is simple, but more deliberate and even studied. It speaks to the poetic and decorative sim sensibilities that Arakawa's work sometimes displayed and to his knowledge of Dimpa painting. Certainly, Arakawa took inspiration directly or indirectly from the famous hand scroll of poems by the 36 immortal poets with the calligraphy of Hon Nami Koetsu and the underpainting by Tawaraya Sotatsu the precursor of the Rinpa school. In keeping with the aesthetics of his very different medium, Arakawa limited himself to only two cranes. Of course, Arakawa did not appropriate all his <coughs> motifs from Rinpa painting, and Nezumi Shino was far from his sole interest. In contrast, <coughs> working some three decades later, Wakao Toshisada Sensei did commit himself to exploring more fully the potential of creatively adapting motifs from Rimpa into works of Nezumi Shino. We see the fullness of that embrace in this striking box. The iris leaves and flower, together with the rectangles of dark gray, immediately call to mind some of the greatest works of Rimpa's founder, Ogata Korin. These two paintings, the one above in the Nezu Museum and the other below in the Metropolitan, show two approaches to evoking the Eight Plank Bridge episode from the Tales of Issei, one more elusive and the other more explicit. Irises and bridge became a mainstay in Mimpa painting and craft design. The most striking example of the latter is this lacquer box, believed to be designed by Cody. Brilliant gold leaves and mother of pearl flowers stand out against the black surface, while rectangles of dull metal representing the planks cross over and frame them. When we look at Cody's and Wakao Sensei's boxes together, we can clearly see this kind of art and perhaps even the very object that inspired the latter's work but we can see something else at least as important. The way in which Wakao Sensei has thoughtfully adapted the chosen motifs to the aesthetics of his own particular medium of Nezumishino. He has radically reduced the number, of, the number and magnified them all the better to explore the possibilities offered by an unevenly glazed surface. He has even played with the positive negative reversal so basic to Nezumishino by thickly applying white glaze to the leaves to give them a greater sense of substance. He has brought Rinpa and Nezumishino aesthetics together to produce something altogether new. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, it's a marriage of aesthetics that I've learned from my old professor, Mieko Morase, and um, it couldn't be better said by anyone. Thank you. And I think at this point, it's your turn to ask a question of Wakao Toshisada Sensei. So would you like to present your question? Yes, please. Um, uh, 
Sensei, since you take inspiration from Rinpa painting, I'm very interested in the role that sketching or drawing plays in your work. Do you make many sketches of Rinpa paintings or Rinpa style imagery, or simply sketch out your own designs, perhaps simply based uh, on nature rather than historical precedent? I'm very curious to know. はい、ハンスルビ、イジノ、ビノ、あ、伝統があります。ネズミ デッサンは、海側、創造と創作の基本だと思います。スケッチします。迷ったらリンパは私の師ですから、ネズミ師のの輪に花は花になられという言葉があり、自然と古典の和心の詩です。詩ですから、双方から影響を受けています。The ball has dropped to me. Okay, Catherine, we're going to transition from Japanese drawing to um, American drawing by an American gifted potter. So in your statement to me, uh, you talk about using the daily practice of drawing and painting to inform your clay art. Can you tell us about how these two-dimensional and three-dimensional art forms intersect in your own personal oeuvre? Catherine, you might be muted. I'm not sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, we're still on the drawing. Here we go. Okay, thank you. Um, in my work, I'm always searching for a balance between form and surface. And while drawing, I may be thinking about the form of a new idea or how to refine um, something from an, uh, ser a previous series. And um, as an undergraduate, I went often to the Freer and the Sackler and um, often went, and graduate student, um, went into the storage to handle pots and to gain an understanding of the material and the heft, the touch of the potter's hand um, and the feeling of glaze. And later when I got to travel to Japan, um, I saw this really deep relationship between the landscape um, in Japan and the way things were depicted on pots, specifically say in Karatsu, where I'd seen these paintings of pine trees on platters and they just seemed bizarre to me until I saw pine trees there and went, oh, this makes sense. This is really drawn from a specific landscape and it's translated through the potter's hand and eye. So um, let's go on to the next slide here. So here's a another Nizumishino piece. Um, and I just thought I'd talk a little bit about it as the artist as opposed, I love hearing what our scholars have to say. Um, but first of all, I look at form and then I think about the way, the, the quality of the clay, the way this iron slip has been poured or brushed on. And then the pattern of the grass uh, scrofitoed through that iron slip. So you're seeing the quality of the clay, the quality of the drawing, and then the glaze over the whole thing and fired. Um, 
So when I work, we'll go on to the next slide here. I may go out to my Virginia landscape. Here, this is a winter grass. Um, and really think about this specificity of my indigenous landscape and the things that I see. And um, as I begin to draw, it's a kind of um, meditation on an idea. And, and it'll, drawing allows me to make um, visual associations that are not verbal. And it guides me to focus on the de details of the local landscape. So my studio, I'm working on an absorbent surface and I've dusted an iron bearing clay onto the surface and taken this handmade brush and brushed through the um, iron clay. And then I go to the next slide and I take a wet slab with a white slip on it and press it into that dust basically making a print. And you have some of this positive negative kind of feeling that um, Jean was talking about. Next image. And these are um, then fired in my anagama. So there's no applied glaze. The glaze happens through the ash moving through the kiln and it being hot in the atmosphere of the kiln. So the drawing is a kind of material translation. Um, and then in these, it's as well the material image as the physical kind of thinking about form. Um, like these, the kind of dimpled edges here, the, these were thrown and then slightly squared. And they're sort of reminiscent of that Nezumi uh, Shino platter that we started um, looking at. And in this case, these were made for um, a project with Omena Zen, a restaurant in Soho that I've been working with for almost 40 years. Um, and so each of these sets of plates had a box that went with it and there was a painting that went with it. So it's just another example of um, how painting and the pots and drawing is all intertwined. Um, so then we'll go to the last one here. Um, I feel this quote from this poem by Charles Wright speaks to the question of how tradition and mon modernity intersect. Every true poem is a spark and aspires to the condition of the original fire. And so, you know, as I work, I'm always look, trying to think about what was the original idea? Where was the seed of that idea, either in the history of ceramics or in how we look at our landscape? And as the child of two artists, my father was a sculptor and my mother was a printmaker and a poet. Um, and I'm the mother of another artist. Uh, from my parents, I have examples of work habits and the way they innovated in, in their um, approach. And now I watch my daughter discover her own direction and watch what influences she chooses to incorporate into her work. And I have great empathy and admiration for the Wakao family as they learn from each other and continue to forge their singular paths. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I actually have eaten off of some of your plates uh, uh -huh. at the home of Halsey and Alice North who are with us today. And I can uh, attest to the fact, not only are they beautiful, but they rest very nicely in your lap as you're perched having a buffet dinner at their apartment. <laughs> and the food tastes even better when eaten off of them. So uh, congratulations for that. So uh, Catherine, I think maybe it's time. I know you have a question actually for both Wakao um, Toshisada Sensei and his son Kay, so we can bring Kay into the discussion as well. Yes, they do. So thank you. Um, I wonder, can you talk a little bit about how you've learned um, from each other, either from your son or your father, respectively, and um, your chosen aesthetic paths? 
若い感性と新しい技術などを学ぶことがありますが、いろいろ営業を受けて、独自の生成学に、えー、生かしています。スタイルが違って見えるってよく言われるんですけど、えー、と本人としてはそういう感覚はあまりありません、えー、と技法なんかは違うんですけれども土を焼くこととか、えー、造形などの考え方あと作品を作る精神的なことなんていう基本的なことはほとんど父の影響を受けていると思いますこれは本人にまだ言ってないことはないんですけれども、えー、普段政治を作ってる時に、えー、ときに土の厚さとか、えー、と釉薬の厚さを考えすぎて慎重になりすぎて造形が弱々しくなることがあります。えー、とそういった時に父の仕事を見ることができて、まあ、冷静になったり鼓舞,され鼓舞されることもあります。Um, you here you see photos of their studio, which is very elegant, and I just see in a chat I was looking from Andy Matsky asking this was America, but there is something very expansive about their property and very gracious that versus the tightness that you often encounter in a Japanese home or studio.、Um, so it's 100% um, there in Gifu. So、uh, next, I'd like to go back to Jean. And I know Jean has a special question that he'd like to ask Wakao K. e i Yes.、Um, could you? Please tell me、um, about the blackness of your fired clay, which is in such contrast to the creamy colored clay we normally see in works from the Mino area. What inspired you to turn to such, in such a boldly different direction? And did ceramics from outside of Mino play a role? <clears throat> えー、っと最初遊びで、えっと、本来は洋変で赤土を黒くし中国の宋時代の、えっと、国体のもの二重貫入の政治を作ろうとしました、えー、っとそのうちに自分自身の作品を作りたくなって貫入を際立てるために釉薬の透明度がだんだん強くなりそれに合わせて造形が強くなってきましたその釉薬と、えっと、造形を生かすために、えー、結局最初の黒い生地を使うことになりました、えー、陶器の伝統的なもの以外で、えー最初に衝撃を受けた感覚を覚えたのは、えっと、小学校の時に出会った鎌田庄司さんの作品で、えー、それも今の作品に影響していると思います。Back to you. Uh, I should say,、um, Kamoda Shoji had a huge impact on my life also. I fell in love with his work at a retrospective exhibition in 1987. And I'm, I, I'm not sure everyone here knows who Kamoda is.、Uh, he's been considered by many experts to be the greatest Japanese ceramic artist of the 20th century. And in an unrivaled period of, of 11 years, he transformed the aesthetic appreciation of modern ceramics in Japan. And I'm really delighted to announce that the first museum exhibition of his work, solo exhibition outside of Japan, Will open at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts、uh, one year from today. And、uh, with all loans derived from American collections. This is very, very exciting and something to look forward to. And hopefully, we'll have more people、um, falling in love with his work.、Uh, our next question is from、uh, Louise, I think, to Wakao k e i s a n Could you ask your question, please?
Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Joan. And Kei-sensei, um, some of your beautiful wave-like forms also use marbleized clay, if I understand correctly. And it's visible under the glaze where the glaze is thin and gives me a sense of looking at um, the spray of waves. Can you tell us more about how you incorporated this element into your formal uh, work and what inspired it? And I also am curious to know how you envision your waves like vessels being used. Thank you. で、かなり生地の質の色によって油薬の色の見え方が変わります。で、本来は油薬の厚みが均一で、えっと、色も裏のないことが一番大事なことって言われてるんですけど、えっと、自分の造形が政治の伝統的なものから、えっと、躍動感のある表現に変わっていくと、えっと、その均一さが作品に合わなくなってきました。そこで、えっと、油薬の厚みをこう極端に変えて表情をつけて、えっと、さらに
、えー、と僕の思う陶芸とは感覚的にずれが出てきましたで熱い釉薬をかけてきっちりと焼きたくなったのが始まりですえー、と実は父が子どもの頃に<笑>、うん、小山先生の手伝いをしていたことがあって、えー、と僕も小さい頃からよく見えてて、えー、と父本人も中国陶器に興味があるよね。<笑>で、中国陶器に接する機会も多かったんで、えー、と、身の以外のものだからっていう感覚はあまりありませんでした。身の自体は、えー、と古くから、えー、と今まで、えー、と出したようなものを作るところで、えー、桃山のものでさえ、えー、と最初はコピーしようとしたんですけど、えー、と多くのアレンジを加えてオリジナルにしてしまう気風があるので、えー、作ることはあまり困難ではありませんでした基本的な政治が好きな方々には、えー、とこれは政治じゃないとかえー、と政治でそのようなことは知ってはいけないって言われることはよくあります、ね、ただそう言われることは、えー、と僕がオリジナルの作品を作っているからって考えています Thank you、uh, I couldn't agree more both effective and working beautifully、um, just for our audience here I think well Louise certainly knows who Koyama Fujio is But since she's a recipient of the award bearing his name, but for our audience who doesn't know,、um, Koyama sensei was a, a scholar in, in SV who wrote many books and articles, some of which have been translated very beautifully into English, but he was also a distinguished partner in his own right.、Uh, and he, but he's best known as a researcher on the kilns of Japan, China, and Korea. And he, his discovery of a Song Dynasty kiln that made Hakuji at、uh, Dingyao is very well uh, uh, documented. Uh, he's also, interestingly, was very important in this, the establishment of the Ningen Kokoho system for、uh, living national treasures.、Uh, but、um, I think to have Koyama Fujio in your life as a mentor and as a, an aesthetic、mm -hmm. sounding board. Um, uh, clearly, had an, a profound influence on the Wakao family. And it's a very、mm -hmm. interesting point to think about when we consider the genius of both father and son. Yes. So,、um, uh, could we have the next slide, please?、Uh, before I thank them, I just want to remind people of our upcoming events. On、uh, November 5th, we will be having a Conversation with、uh, four of my friend artists, Akiyama Yo and Kitamura Junko, who will be having their conjoint show at our gallery. And they will be joined by Kondo Takahiro and Nakamura Takuo,、uh, not to talk about process and not to talk about how they make things, but how they see their art form fitting in on a global stage.、Uh, we will take up other issues. And following that, next slide, please. Uh, we will have a discussion in conjunction with a exhibition that's traveling to near us in New York at the Katona Museum of Art, Hands and Earth, which some of you may have seen at the Crow Museum or at the Lowe Museum in Miami,、uh, which is selections and highlights from the Carol and Jeffrey Horvitz collection. And we will be having a dialogue hosted by the Katona Museum with Futamura Yoshimi from Paris, who's with us tonight. And Takiguchi Kazuo from、uh, Kyoto, both of whom have several works in that exhibition.、Okay. So, thank you all for joining us tonight. For I think, I hopefully, for all of you, as illuminating a discussion as I found it. 
and most hearted thank yous to Wakao Sensei and to Wakao K, who got up this morning, got dressed, looked so handsome in their shirts and their jackets at six o'clock in the morning uh, mm -hmm. to be with us now. I wish I looked half as good at six o'clock in the morning and was so articulate. We loved having you with us. It was really important. Thank you for trusting me with your beautiful art form. And thank you, my audience here, for supporting what we do so uh, art artfully and so avidly that enables us to bring these programs to you. So good night, everyone. And I hope to see you at least on November 5th, if not before. In person, we are open by appointment only, but we would welcome any of you if you are in New York and want to come by and actually see these beautiful works in person. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy your dinners tonight. <laughs> thank you, Joan. Thank you.